Okay, let's start. I'm very, very happy to be with everybody uh, this evening. So thank you for letting me uh, come. I have been to India once. I would love to come again. Uh, I absolutely love my time there. I was there for about six weeks. Um, so uh, this evening, what I'd like to talk about is pet birds. And again, my practice is dogs and cats and a lot of small animals, but we also do a lot of exotic animals and birds, you know, reptiles and rabbits, uh, chickens uh, and pet birds. And this evening, I say the uh, thing we'd like to talk about is kind of a uh, over introductory wise is pet birds in veterinary practice. Uh, which ones do we see? And also how do we keep the birds in what kind of cages and how do we keep them happy and uh, uh, what they call enrichment? Uh, keep them busy so they don't get bored. Uh, what kind of diets do we feed? And also some of the procedures like clipping the nails, clipping their wings, taking care of their beaks. And some people want to do a lot with birds and some people want to do just a little bit with birds. But these are things that you can do even if you don't want to do complicated things. So with that, uh, the first thing is what kind of birds do we see? And uh, generally there's what they call citizen birds. Now these are called hookbills and they're macaws and parrots, uh, conures, uh, budger gars, which in the United States, a lot of times we call parakeets. Uh, and then also there's the passerine birds, which are songbirds. And these are canaries and finches and the smaller birds. And this is a blue and gold macaw. And this is one of the bigger birds. Uh, what you find is this is a very loud bird and a very powerful bird and not a good bird for an apartment because your neighbors are gonna be upset at you for the screaming. Uh, but these birds will um, quite often live to 50 years old. And I know one bird that was over a hundred years old. So they live for a long time. We also get into the smaller birds. These are the budgerigars from Australia. And again, sometimes in the United States, we call them parakeets. And they are small birds. Uh, the, the males can talk. And um, they are, they're very pleasant. They live for around 10 years. So uh, they have a nice lifespan. And they are very good for apartments and uh, uh very nice for people to own. We get into like, uh, this is an African gray parrot, but you get into parrots, you get into, uh, and there's a lot of different types, African grays, there's a uh, double yellow head Amazon parrots from South America. Again, these are uh, the middle size birds, but if they bite you, there's a good bite there. Uh, this is a gala, which is a cockatoo from Australia. It's a rose-breasted cockatoo, or like I say, they call them a gala over there. They are very sweet. They want a lot of attention. They're very, very sweet birds. Um, and there's a lot of different types of cockatoos. We get into, uh, this is a cockatiel, and it's a smaller bird. Again, lives about... 15 to 20 years, very good um, in pets and very nice birds. And quite often, probably one of the most popular birds in the United States. We can tell that this one is a male because you'll notice the orange patch on the cheek here on the boys is very dark orange and on the girls is very light orange. So that's one of the small things you can tell on cockatiels. On most of the birds, you cannot tell whether they're boys or girls without having to uh, check DNA sexing and things like that. This is a passerine bird. This is a canary. Notice the small beak compared to uh, the hooked beak here, but the small beak, these uh, are very small birds. They usually live about six or seven years. They eat small seed and they sing very pretty. Uh, so they're nice. Again, here's a zebra finch and they're very, very small birds and people like to keep them in cages and they just make cute sounds, uh, but they are not the birds that are going to have 
a relationship with you. This is called Forshaw's Parrots of the World. It is an excellent book for having different pictures of the parrots and the macaws and the big birds in it. And I have this in my practice because sometimes they'll bring a bird in and the people don't know what kind of bird they have. And sometimes, even if I haven't seen one for a long time, I have to go look it up also. But it's an inexpensive bird uh, book. It's been there for a long time, been out. So it is a, uh, a very good book to have on the shelf sometimes for identification. The other thing we start thinking about, again, we've seen large birds, small birds, is what kind of cages do you keep the birds in and how do we keep them happy? Because if you and I were sitting in a room our whole life with nothing to do but eat out of a bowl, we would be bored and eventually we'd have problems and the birds are the same way. So how do we keep them happy? Well, this is, uh, this is Barney. This is one of my birds. And Barney is a blue front Amazon parrot. But you'll notice we leave the cage open for Barney. Barney, it's a large cage. Uh, he can climb around on the cage. In front of the cage, you can see a climbing area. And he, has, he will climb around on that. He will eat. Uh, play with his toys up on top. And you'll notice he's looking at a box and we put cardboard boxes up there and Barney likes to tear them up. One of the nice things about uh, the parrots and the macaws is we can keep them busy by giving them toys. And a lot of times those toys are paper or cardboard or boxes and they can, and wood, and they can tear those up. When we get a smaller bird, this is a conure, a little smaller than uh, a parrot, but you'll notice we have a cage that he can get around in and uh, has some toys in there and the water and the food in front. And again, some people want the birds out and some people kind of like to keep them in their cages. And there's no problem with that. We just wanna make sure the cage is large enough that the bird is comfortable. These are parakeets or the budgergars. And again, you can see how people keep uh, a lot of toys in there. Uh, they have their food and their water. And hopefully there's things they can do. And a lot of times people will clip the wings. And I will discuss that later is clipping the wings so that they can come out of the cage and still not fly all over the house or the apartment. There are four macaws in this cage, um, and this is only, they're only in this cage for travel. They normally uh, would not live this close together without getting in trouble. But this is a cage which is made by the owner, and we call this in the United States welded wire. It would be the type of cage that you would uh, have for fences for chickens or something like that. One problem with welded wire is if we make homemade cages, we will take vinegar and, and scrub the wire very well because it has zinc on it. Anything that is galvanized wire will have zinc. And the birds, if they chew on this wire, they can get zinc toxicity, which they can live through, but we don't want that to happen. So we would scrub this with zinc. If we have the cages that are you know, like this, that is not a problem. Like I say, birds in the wild spend about a third of their day looking for food. They spend about a third of the day socializing with other birds and about a third of the day taking care of their feathers. And one of the problems that we have in veterinary medicine is uh, when people keep the pet birds, they put the food in a bowl. And instead of having to look for their food for a lot of hours of the day, they just end up eating in 15 minutes. And that gives them a lot of extra time that they have to decide what to do with. And what we want to do is give them a job or give them something to take up their time. Otherwise, 
they end up spending too much time socializing, which is for them screaming, or they spend a lot of time uh, taking care of their feathers, but then they do what they call feather picking and um, you end up with birds that look like this. And we don't want a bird to over groom and it's easier to prevent the problem than it is to try to cure the problem because now we have kind of a mental problem where they have learned to uh, pick at themselves and it would be like a child chewing on their fingernails or something like this. It's just a bad habit. And one of the things we like to do is give them things to tear up. Birds are very good at tearing things up. And this can be cardboard boxes like Barney has here. And he just chews this up or paper and they'll tear paper up or the bigger birds will like to chew up wood. And we just use like a wood that you would build a house with. When we get into the diets of the birds, um, different birds eat different things. The, uh, it's important to try to get a diet that is varied or very uh, diverse. And your finches and your canaries and your passerines will primarily eat small grain or seeds. The larger birds will eat grain and seeds, but also they can eat vegetables and uh, rice, pasta, beans, uh, again, vegetables. They can even have some meat, uh, such as chicken. So they can eat the same thing uh, that we eat. I call that people food, as long as it is not very greasy or real fatty foods. Also, we don't want them to have a lot of sugar. So no candy, um, but you can see this is some of the grain that the seeds that we feed in the United States. Um, up at the top, we see uh, the smaller seed and the larger seed, which the larger birds eat. On the bottom, you can see the seed for the smaller birds. And these are just very small seed that the birds will, like I say, when they eat, they take the outside of the seed off or the hole and just swallow the inside. Unlike chickens or ducks that just swallow the whole, you know, the whole seed and use our gizzard. So these guys will hold their seed. Um, here in the United States, we also have bird pellets that they have come out with. And there's many companies, Lefebvre and Harrison and uh, Zupreme and a lot of different uh, KT, a lot of different pellets out there. Um, but in most cases, um, I don't know how much opportunity your birds would have to be on pellets. And if they are on seed diets, you have to be very slow to change them over to the pellets because you they don't recognize the pellets as food. So if you start seeing the pelleted diets, you just need to know that there are ways to change a bird over to pelleted food. And again, you can find that out at a website at the bottom of this. It says lefebvre.com is has very good information. Along with the seed, one way that you can help the nutrition is to sprout the seed. And lentils or alfalfa, all sorts of seeds and grains can be sprouted. And what we will do that way is we'll take and put it in a glass of water overnight, and then we'll pour the water out and just keep uh, the seed or the grain in uh, some, uh, like a damp, a little bit um, of a damp towel. And after a, one or two days, it will barely start sprouting and we don't want long sprouts. We just want barely the sprout to start coming out of the uh, seed. And then if we do that, uh, that helps with more protein and also with uh, some of the vitamins and minerals that is a different than just the uh, dry seeds. And again, fruits and vegetables uh, can be given to birds. And uh, generally I have clients that when they eat dinner at night, they, the bird is on the table eating off of its own plate, eating the same thing the owners are eating. So some birds, again, we want a very 
varied diet, just like we feed our children. We want fruits and vegetables and, uh, you know, different, you know, uh, breads and different things like this. So we do the same thing for the birds. And uh, the small birds usually will eat a little bit of a leafy green, but mainly they will eat grains and seed. Always, always um, find out what the breeder or who, where they bought the bird, you know, where they were, uh, what they were feeding. And a lot of times I will use that to help my judgment on what to tell the people to continue feeding. When we get into taking care of the birds, some people want to do a lot of medicine and some people want to do very little medicine, but everybody should know how to uh, clip wings and clip nails and take care of beaks. So um, these are procedures that, first of all, you need to know how to hold the bird. Then we need to know how to do the medicine on the bird. And again, later on, we will talk about in different uh, talks, uh, antibiotics, and other uh, problems that birds have and what we do about that. But this is just a simple husbandry in the management right now. But when I am clipping toenails and the wings uh, of birds and beaks, uh, you do not need a lot of equipment. So this is not something you need to pay a lot of money to get new things for. What I like to do is for nails, just right here in the very center, I like to use human fingernail clippers, work very, very well. And then um, also I will have, uh, let's see, I will also use for the, uh, the wings, a pair of scissors and nail clippers sometimes work nicely because sometimes scissors kind of slide off the feather a little bit. And, uh, with these clippers, they kind of clip onto the feather, but that's the only reason I use those. And then at the very top, we always want to have something uh, like a blood stopping powder, uh, or uh, what I use here is a liquid clodosol. But bird toenails are like dog toenails and cat toenails, where if you cut them too far, they will bleed. And there's a little blood vessel that goes through the toenails so that. Uh, I always have this ready every time that I'm uh, clipping toenails on a bird. So if I clip one too short by accident, I'll be able to uh, quickly reach over and do this and not have to leave the room, go find it while the bird is having a little bit of a problem. So, and birds can lose, it, it's not just one or two drops of blood, they can lose uh, quite a bit of blood before it's dangerous, but it is very upsetting to the owners. So when we talk about nail clipping here, um, the first thing is we have to catch the bird. And remember the bigger birds, if they get you before you get them, it'll be a little bit painful. So I like to use towels uh, to hold the birds rather than gloves because I don't want them afraid of hands. So I don't want them to think I'm just grabbing them. So I'll use uh, large towels on big birds and small towels like washcloths on the smaller birds. And this is me when, if I am reaching into a cage, I will basically try to put the towel over the top of them and then I will hold their head kind of like I am holding a ball. And I will hold, you'll notice my hands, my fingers are kind of on their ears. And this is sometimes on the top of their head. So I'm holding them just like I would hold a ball and um, with the towel. So what I try to think of is they think the towel is holding them, not me holding them. So a lot of times when I let them go later on, they're not mad at me at all. But if they're on a table, I will just put the towel over the top of them like this. And then I will try to find the head. And again, I'm reaching kind of over their ears on the side. 
and pick them up this way. And then I will pass them to a technician or an assistant that will hold. You can see how we're holding the bird's head. And then we will also hold the feet. And what I do there is I have my fingers like this and the two feet go between my fingers. And then I just hold them down like this, just like that. And when I do that, that way I can now examine the bird. I can clip the nails. I can clip the wings. I can do anything I want, but this is the safest way to hold a bigger bird. Remember that they breathe by their chest going up and down. Birds have air sacs and rather than the lungs holding the air, the air sacs hold the air. So we don't wanna put any pressure on the chest or they won't be able to breathe. So I just wanna be able to, hold them to the side and hold their feet. And then once I have them like this, I can take, you'll notice here I'm taking the uh, fingernail clippers and clipping the nails. And if I would clip a nail too short and I would see a little bit of blood, I would just squeeze on that nail and that will put some pressure on it and keep it from bleeding. I will reach over and get a little bit of the clotisol here or the blood stop touch it to the nail, just like I would do a toenail on a dog. And once it stops bleeding, which is very easy, then I move on to the next nails. And we just make sure we clip all the nails and um, take care of it that way. The main reason I'm clipping nails is either the nails are sharp and they're painful to the owners, or the nails are starting to curl around and uh, they are getting caught in the cage or caught in the owner's clothes if the parrot would be sitting on their shoulder or on their arm or something like this. So those are the two reasons I'm clipping nails. If the nails are perfectly fine, tell the owner they're perfectly fine and they don't need to be clipped. So when I get smaller birds, uh, a smaller bird, what I am doing to hold them is instead of a, a towel, and this is the passerine birds with the small beaks, they're not gonna hurt you at all. And what I do with those is I just cage them in my hand. I don't wanna squeeze them because I want their chest to go up and down so they can breathe, but I will just cage them in my hand. And you'll notice that's what I'm doing here. And then I can pull their feet kind of through my fingers and then I can clip their toenails that way or I can have an assistant do the same thing and then I can clip the toenails. One nice trick with small birds, whether they be finches or canaries or budgerigars, the smaller ones, is sometimes when you reach into their cage, they get very, very scared and they fly around and we don't want them to get too excited and hurt themselves. And so what I will do is turn out the lights so it's dark in the room and birds don't like to fly in the dark. So I can then take um, a little flashlight or actually my cell phone flashlight and I will turn it on, kind of see where they are. And then once I see where they are, I'll turn it off and just kind of reach in there where they were. And usually I can just pick them up very gently and bring them out, turn on the light. And the owners are very impressed that we know how to do this. And uh, you get the bird without getting them real excited. If you look at this bird's nails here, you can see how they really curl around. And that's why this bird was here. The toenails, this toenail is not curling. This one, these aren't curling, but this one is very, very curly. And again, we just, um, that's the reason we're, we're clipping these nails. When we're doing wing clips, wing clipping is so, I tell people for one of three reasons. Uh, number one is if they are worried that the door or the window would be open or children are coming in and out and the bird could escape, we don't want that to happen. Number two, um, some birds would just fly around and run into windows and mirrors and, and furniture and just possibly hurt themselves that way if they get very excited. Number three is usually Sometimes the birds are just 
not behaving nicely. They don't want to sit with the owner and they want to fly to the top of the curtains or they want to fly up high. And um, we just don't want that to happen. There's also a fourth reason probably is if they first get a bird and they want the bird to um, get with them and learn, be their best friend, they don't want the bird just continuing flying off. So it's a good way to help train. Now, remember, if we're wing clipping, uh, when I clip wings on a bird, it will last for about six months. So it's a haircut. It, there's no pain involved. Um, and it, the, the feathers will grow back. So if a person decides later on they don't want to do another wing trim, that's fine. If they do and the bird is starting to start flying again, then they come back to you for another wing trim. And again, this is where we're holding the bird. This is an African gray parrot and we're clipping the wings this way. But the way we clip wings is here is uh, a wing and you can see uh, the primary feathers up here. These are the feathers that they are flying with. These are the secondary feathers and they really are more landing feathers down here. So these are the feathers we want to clip out here. And you can see a little line of short feathers called coverlet feathers. And that is our dotted line. So I am going to take and clip these feathers, one, two, three, four, five. And when I get finished, it should look just like this. So I'm taking these feathers and just clipping right at the coverlet feathers. And when I get finished, I'll have the five feathers gone on the end. And I will do that on both wings uh, so that they will float down evenly. And these birds will usually be able to flap their wings and they'll go to the ground. And it will take them probably, uh, oh, two to three meters uh, before they get to the ground. So they don't, I don't want them to drop like a rock. I want them to be able to fly to the bottom. But this is how we do this. And this is the top of the wing, you'll notice. Uh, so again, here's my bird. There are my coverlet feathers right here. And I'm just going to trim these feathers right here. So he looks just like this. Another thing on Budrigars is you'll notice his nostrils, his sear here, is blue. And on Budrigars, in most cases, if the sear is blue, it is a boy. If it is pink, it is a girl. So um, that is a good way to tell. The other thing that is interesting is on the young birds, and we are talking birds that are only about, you know, uh, less than three or four months old, these stripes will go all the way down to their nose. And as they get older, the stripes start going back. And I can tell that this is an adult bird and not a baby because of the forehead. And that's just a small little things that you learn about birds. But here is a bird, a parrot. And you'll notice the last two feathers are, have been left long. And I don't like to do this. And the reason I don't like to do this is uh, quite often they can fly with the two, the end two feathers left. So what we used to do a long time ago, what I used to do is leave two feathers and then cut five feathers. But I found that a lot of birds can fly. So now I do it uh, like we were talking here where we just cut the end feathers. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is on the underside of this wing, there's also coverlet feathers right here. I don't like to cut even with these feathers because the wings are a little too short. And once they are cut, the edges of um, what's left rubs against the side of the bird and it kind of irritates them. So I like to do it from the, uh, I like to do it from the, uh, the top instead of the bottom. Also, you notice 
the person that clipped this wing left it too long. This bird be, would be able to fly with these feathers like this. So, like I said, that's how I like to uh, uh, do the wing trims that way. Now, this is called a blood feather. This is a new feather that is growing in. And the situation here is this, where it shows B, is there's blood in that feather. So if you cut the feather at that point, this will bleed. And we don't want that. So I always have to make sure if there's a new feather coming out, I cut it beyond the blue area just where I have the A right here. So I wanna cut the feather out here and it will not bleed, but if I cut it in here, it will bleed. So, and if I would have a feather that does start bleeding, um, sometimes, and we'll talk about it next time, I will hold the wing just at the base of the wing and take a pair of hemostats or pliers and gently pull the uh, feather out and kind of uh, just hold where it was hooking into the wing, it will stop bleeding and a new feather will start growing back and they will have a new feather in about six weeks. But it's best not to, uh, we, we just really don't wanna make that mistake and uh, cut these, uh, these blood feathers. So like I said, that's something that if they have one of those, we just either skip that feather or just trim it a little bit and go that route. On beak care, remember on the nails, we're clipping nails because they are either too sharp or too long or curling around and getting caught in things. If I'm trimming the wing, I'm trimming the wings because I don't want the bird to be able to fly all around and I want them a little more dependent on us. If uh, I, I always tell people that sometimes I want to take their car keys away. If I don't want somebody traveling a long distance, I will take away their car keys and they can't leave. If I have a bird, I don't want to travel long distance. I wing clip him or take the bird's car keys away. So that's when we're doing that on beaks. In most cases, we do not need to trim beaks. The only time I will trim a beak is if it is abnormal. And here is a cockatiel and with a very overgrown beak. And the first thing that I thought is, how would you not notice this to let it get this long? So this is really kind of a crazy long beak here, but uh, what I would do is trim it right here where the black arrow is. So I wanna trim it right about here. And um, what you'll see in these birds, and I'll show in a second, is you've got a little notch here and then it comes down a little bit. So this is about where the normal beak would be. And I wanna trim it a little beyond that. Now, there's a blood vessel in the beaks, just like there's a blood vessel in toenails. So remember on a dog toenail, it is made of keratin and beaks are also made of keratin, just like toenails. And there is a blood vessel to the, uh, the middle of it. So if you cut this too short, you will get some bleeding and we would take the, the bleeding powder or the clotisol and stop that bleeding. And it's not a problem, but it's best if you don't do that. In the fact that a lot of birds with beak problems will have to be trimmed regularly. If in doubt, leave it a little bit long. So if we look at this again, here you can see this long beak on this parakeet and it never, never, never should have been allowed to get this long, but sometimes people don't think. And we just try to be as kind to them as we can and hope that they don't do it again. Uh, but here are my uh, toenail clippers and I will clip this beak like this. And, uh, and quite often after we do this, I will take like a fingernail file like uh, a person would use on their fingers. And you can sometimes smooth it a little bit with a fingernail file. Here's a macaw who has a longer beak. And this bird comes, has to come to me about once a year 
and have the beak trimmed. And you'll notice it can, he can still eat. There's no problem with eating. This is annoying, but he can still get food in his mouth, but we really don't want the beak this long. And so I am going to, I see my little notch here. I'm gonna come down and sometimes what I'll do is trim it here and then slowly start trimming back a little bit. But I, again, I'm gonna trim it right about that area. So this is the beak before, that's the beak after. And you can see where I've, how much distance I've left. Like I said, that's beforehand. And this is after. You will also notice on these beaks that sometimes they will layer. There'll be, see a little ridge right there. And keratin, it's like fingernails where there's kind of layers. That's not a problem. That's totally normal to have layers. So that's the trimmed beak. Some of these birds have very, very heavy beaks. This is a bird that has to come in. Um, it is a problem with the beak. And this beak is very hard because you can see that it's very, very thick. And I am going to trim this beak so the bird can eat and be comfortable. I am not making this bird perfect. And this knot where you trim a beak and never have to trim a beak again. Sometimes you get lucky, but a lot of times the people need to know that this is a problem with the bird. If they were in the wild, they would probably die because of this problem. So uh, uh, you just have to trim that. And if there's any doubt, leave it a little bit long. You don't, if, if you're nervous about trimming it up here, then trim it down here. It won't hurt anything. It just means he'll come back a little, little sooner to be trimmed again. Sometimes we have beaks that the, un, the bottom or the mandible will overgrow like this one. And you'll notice this beak is out and beaks should be just like you and I. We should, we wanna have the top beak over the bottom beak, not the bottom beak in front. So this bird would have a little problem eating. And what we wanna do is trim this beak back here. And if we do that, we are going to trim it. Uh, like I said, there's the beak before and it's sticking out. I wanna trim it so it's behind the beak and there's the beak afterwards. There's also blood in the bottom beak. So you don't wanna go back too far on the bottom beak either. And remember, um, we are just trying to make the beak better, not necessarily make the beak perfect on these birds. These are deformities. So there is a problem there. Also, I was going to show you on this, you'll notice the little feathers sticking out under the eye and they look like little sticks. Those are the new feathers coming in. We call those little pin feathers because they look like pins. And there's a little sheath over the outside of those feathers. So as soon as they grow out, the bird will rub the face or scratch them and the little sheath will fall apart and you'll have a new feather there. So that's just, this tells me that this bird is starting to molt and getting some new feathers. But again, I'm going to trim this beak so it looks, I'm going to go as far back as I can without getting bleeding. And if I do get a little bleeding, I have my bleeding powder to take care of that. Some birds will get what they call a scissor beak. And this is sometimes when we've been hand feeding birds and the upper beak moves sideways. So we have kind of this like this, it ought to be straight on top, but it's not. And it moves sideways a little bit. And the problem with that is as it moves sideways, sometimes this side will grow up higher and you get a bird that all of a sudden their bird, their beak kind of knocks against the bottom beak and they can't do their typical uh, beak movement. So if that mandible gets uh, longer, what we would do is just trim it on this side so it matches this side. And these birds, like I said, can still eat and they do well, but they usually have to be trimmed uh, every so often. 
to make sure that they are uh, that they do well. This is one that has a very bad uh, scissor beak deformity, but you see where the bottom beak or the mandible is coming very far sideways, and the upper beak is overgrown, but the big problem is the lower beak. So what we do is we trim that lower beak where the blue line is right about here. I am not gonna make it perfect. I'm just trying to make it so the bird can eat better. And then if I need to trim the upper beak a little bit, then I can trim the upper beak. This is a bird that we just wanna make sure can live a nice life and be able to eat comfortably we are not going to make this a perfect bird. So that's something the owners needs to know is they will need to be coming back to have this done again. Sometimes you'll get birds. This is a bird where a larger bird at the house uh, with the family bit off this bird's beak. And you can see where the whole beak is gone. Here's the nostrils right on top, but there ought to be a big long beak right here and it's just gone. This bird can eat. Sometimes we have to have small food and sometimes soft food, you know, what I call people food, chopped up so it can eat, but it can live. But sometimes the lower beak will grow too long because there's no upper beak uh, to keep it worn down. So sometimes we'll need to uh, trim this beak, you know, down there. But if this does happen, they can live. When we're trimming beaks, we're trimming them longer so that there's still a growth plate. There's two growth plates on the side of the upper beak and at the very tip. If you go past those growth plates, the beak will not grow again. And this is what happened on this bird. And so we just, when that happened, we kept it very clean. And uh, in one of the future lectures, I will show what can happen to birds when they get their beaks chewed off. But this bird is a very sweet bird uh, and, um, and, it's, and uh, does very well. If a person really wants uh, to look at a lot of videos uh, on different uh, birds and exotics, everything from surgery to taking care of birds, uh, there's a very good site called lefebvre.com. This is a, a company that makes bird pellets in the United States and around the world, but either lefebvre.com or lefebvre.com backslash vet. And you can look at different videos. It's free. It's not a problem. And also, um, like I say, I was president of the Association of Avian Veterinarians. This is an international group, uh, international uh, organization, and you can get on their website at aav.org and either join the association or there's some videos and some materials on that website. So these are very, very good sites to go to. Um, and uh, if you want to, if you just have some time that you want to, to look at some different procedures. And uh, with that, uh, I would say, are there any questions? And also know that if, if you do have questions later on, you can contact uh, Dr. Dixon at the uh, VetNet Foundation at gmail.com. But with that being said, uh, I know if Dr. Dixon has any, if there's any questions, um, or not. Again, I hope to be doing this another couple of times and we'll go into different procedures and different diseases and how to take care of broken bones and things like that. So anything. Yeah, there are some questions in the chat box. Okay. So can I read for this? Uh, yes, please. How is a mirror placed in cage of single bird as an enrichment? Yes, you can put mirrors in the uh, cages of the birds. Um, and sometimes the smaller birds like to see the other bird and, uh, and they will actually think it's another bird. Some like the mirrors, uh, some don't. What is funny is sometimes 
the bird will, if they start regurgitating or vomiting on the mirror, regurgitating on the mirror, that is a sign of being in love. So sometimes I will have birds that actually think uh, that the bird in the mirror is their mate. So if that starts happening, sometimes you wanna take it out, but it never hurts to try putting a small mirror uh, in there for the birds to keep them company. Okay, one more question is there. I mean, so many questions are there. Huh? Uh, uh, please, sorry. Uh, please. Okay. What is the best way to break the feather picking habit? I heard about, heard about red palm oil. How much and how to give? It is very hard. This is a mental problem. Uh, sometimes picking can be because of parasites and or disease. Uh, a lot of times, if they're all by themselves with nothing to do, they will start picking their feathers. In the United States, and I will talk about this in a future lecture also, uh, my favorite is what we call haloperidol or halidol is um, a medication and it is an anti-anxiety medication that can be given to birds. Um, again, one of the problems with medications on birds is trying to get the bird to take the medicine because sometimes it stresses the bird more taking the medicine than it does being in the cage. So we have to be careful about that. The other thing that we'll use is uh, sometimes we can use a little melatonin, which is over the counter here in the United States, but melatonin, and we will use three milligrams of melatonin tablet in eight ounces uh, of water, which would be about uh, 240 milliliters of water. So three milligrams for every 240 uh, milliliters of water, drinking water, and sometimes that will calm them down a little bit. We usually um, don't you you can use Elizabethan collars, which I will go over later, which are the big collars that come over their neck to keep them from hurting themselves. We usually don't use too much oil on the birds just because of the fact that it will it makes them greasy and, and doesn't help. So I'll go over that later, uh, hopefully. But feather picking is one of the worst problems we have because it is in your brain and not in the bird very often. So. Hey, one more question. What yes. line of treatment can be given? The birds are unable to expel the eggs normally. Okay, the birds that are unable to do what now? Unable to lay eggs normally. Oh. To lay eggs, okay. We can, um, egg binding is a problem if, if the egg gets stuck in the bird and I will cover this also next time. And on those, sometimes if we have an egg that's in there, we will try to get the bird warmer. Uh, we will make sure it's not too cold and the bird uh, will try to get them. And I will check my, my centigrade about 85 degrees Fahrenheit um, and try to get them warmer. Sometimes that's not a problem in India because it's warm anyway. Um, and sometimes I will take a little bit of uh, KY jelly, uh, one of the uh, lubricating jellies or an oil and rub that on the inside of the vent and see if we can get to come down. If there's an egg stuck in there where it will not come out, there is what we call pro-banging. And that's where we actually stick a needle through the skin or up through the vent into the egg. We pull out the inside of the yolk and the inside of the egg, squash the egg and let them pass it that way. Um, usually if we have a lot of problems with egg laying, it is a nutrition problem. And that is what we have to talk to the owner about is how to not have this happen again. Okay. Yep. Can you feed them too much pasta and bread? Yes, um, we want everything balanced. So birds, I always tell people, most of the big birds think they are Italian. They love pasta. 
And, uh, but we want to make sure, just like with people, you need to have the right amount of protein, the right amount of carbohydrates and vegetables and fruit. So everything needs to be balanced so they can have pasta, but that's not the only thing they get. We need to make sure that they get a lot of different things, but that is a good part of their diet. One of the things, a lot of times that we used to feed a long time ago, which was called Cray's diet, which from a Dr. Cray in California in the United States, and he would make up a cooked rice and beans. And a lot of the birds will do well with rice and beans. You get protein in the beans and the rice, you get carbohydrates and that works well. So yes, pasta is good, but not only pasta and bread, very minimal bread. We don't want to give them a lot of bread because it doesn't have the nutrition that we want. Okay. What, what foods are toxic to birds? What, what is that again? What are the foods are toxic to the birds? Generally, um, we need to be careful about avocado. Seems avocado, uh, you know, the green fruit can uh, cause heart problems in birds. So we have to be careful with that. We don't want a lot of raw onion or raw garlics. Uh, generally, most of the food that is okay with us is going to be okay with them. Um, so if people can eat it, the birds will be able to eat it. And really the only thing that I watch on the birds is uh, avocado or raw onions or garlic. Um, they can eat the hot peppers. Birds love hot things. Uh, when I was, we have, we have Mexican peppers in the United States and they're hot. They are nothing like Indian peppers. You really know what hot is. I learned a new experience for hot when I was in India, but a lot of times the birds will like peppers. And if they do, that is fine. It won't hurt them. Um, and sour things do not hurt them. So I tell people, uh, we don't, I don't want to give the birds sugar. I don't want to give them caffeine like in coffee. I don't want to give them greasy fried things because uh, they don't need the grease and, and a lot of oil. And uh, I don't give them avocado. And if you stand with that, if you can eat it, the bird can probably eat it. Okay. Okay. What are the anti-bleeding drugs used for in birds for minor injuries? What we'll do is um, on a lot of the birds, if, if I have a... Again, I used what they call clodisol is a liquid to stop bleeding. There are the bleeding powders uh, and it's ferric. Uh, I can't remember the, the actual name of the, the powder, but there's some, it's the same powder that you would use on toenails of birds, uh, on dogs and uh, any animal. Uh, we used to have, for men that used to shave, we had what they call styptic pencils. And if you cut yourself with a razor, you would hold a little thing there to, uh, to stop the bleeding. Those can be used. Um, that may be available there. If the other thing that you can always use is if somebody is at home and we get uh, a cut, I will take some flour or some cornstarch and I can push flour against it. And a lot of times that will stop the bleeding and you can, uh, if you need to, you can use some flour. Uh, also a little gentle pressure against it, just like any other cut, if you hold a pressure against it, uh, that will help until the platelets come and help the clotting. Okay. Did that, did that work? Please tell some of the ailments of birds and remedies. Okay. And that's what we're gonna go over the next two times is yeah. going to be, there's a lot of different diseases uh, that are out there a lot. What I am finding with bird medicine is a lot of the problems can be prevented um, rather than needed to be treated. Um, and uh, it's just like chickens. Uh, when people have chickens, you know, if you have sick chickens, you want to keep the, the healthy chickens away from the sick ones so they don't get sick. And a lot of times the sick chickens, there could have been something to prevent that. So we'll go over that, but also there's bacterial 
and viral infections in birds. And sometimes there's treatments on many of the viral infections. There are no treatments. We have to make sure to isolate those birds so nobody else gets sick. We need to be wise on where the people are buying their birds and make sure they're buying healthy birds. Um, then there's uh, problems like broken legs or wings that are having problems or uh, trauma to the bird if they get cut or, or something like this. And we'll go over that later, uh, hopefully uh, in another mm -hmm. session. Hopefully everybody can join that and we'll, we'll cover some of that. Which instrument nail cut? We have a little background there. What was the question again? Um, how to clip the beak? Which instrument yeah. should use nail cutter? Yes. What I like to do when I clip beaks is I will use, um, usually clipping these beaks, I will either use finger, the larger toenail clippers like this, or uh, sometimes, and we will go all the way back here, but I will actually use uh, these orange handled, you know, some clippers like this and, uh, and clip the beaks that way. The other thing that you can use is on some big birds, uh, I will use what they call a Dremel drill and it's a little handheld battery drill and it has a cutter on it and we can trim them that way. And in the next lecture, I will have a Dremel there so people can see what that looks like. But normally, normally I will use fingernail and toenail clippers even on the big birds because usually those can are wide enough that I'm able to uh, clip. And sometimes you have to clip a side and a side and then the middle, but, but you can clip them that way. I have actually had to use, sometimes I've had to use a small saw and that gets very, very difficult there. So in most cases, you, you can just use the uh, toenail clippers. Anything else? Yeah. Uh... What is the best management in summer season in diet, water, vitamin C? What is the best what? Summer management in the heat. How to keep oh, the, in the heat? Birds. Yeah. yeah. Birds, birds, their normal body temperature, and, and I apologize because I only know it in Fahrenheit, is 105 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. So they have very warm body temperatures. So the birds generally do well in hot weather. So usually you're okay. One thing about birds is if birds are cold, they will fluff their feathers out to try to insulate themselves. If they are too hot, they'll hold their wings out so the air can come under their wings. So if you have a bird that has their mouth open and their wings kind of away from their body, that is a bird that's too hot. Um, Generally, birds do okay in the heat. The only thing you want to do is make sure they're in the shade so that they're not out in the sun, you know, just like a person. So make sure you have shade. Um, as far as uh, the food, usually seed and grain does okay in the heat. On the sprouts, you know, I talked about soaking them in water and making sprouts. Sprouts can, they can get mold and mildew on those. So they can get rotten. So those have to be kept cool, like in a refrigerator or something, uh, as far as that goes. But uh, like I say, the birds generally will do well with, with heat as long as they're in the shade. How do we manage cloacal prolapse in birds? Okay. Uh, cloacal prolapses are something, again, I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to talk about that. It, this is usually, sometimes this is a, uh, a problem with their nutrition, with their protein, and also with the calcium in their body. So we want to make sure that they are getting the proper amounts of food and sometimes vitamins and minerals if we need that. Um, sometimes with a prolapse, what if, if it comes out, I will take a 
cotton swab or a Q-tip, what we call a Q-tip with a little stick with a cotton on the end of it. And I will get that lubricated with a little bit of oil or KY jelly, a lubricant, and I will poke it, we will poke it back in. But then usually we have to put a little stitch on the cloaca to keep it from coming back out. And, uh, and, and I, I have pictures of that. So I will show how that is done also. Uh, but the problem with cloacal prolapses is, is that can be very dangerous. And that is showing that there's a health issue with the bird and usually with breeder birds. In my experience, it's birds that do not have the right amount of calcium. How about feather stripping rather than clipping? When you do clip, the aesthetic value get lost. And see, practice only feather stripping to pet birds. Repeat that one more time. I got most of it. Sorry. How about no, feather good. stripping rather than clipping? When do rather we, than clip? When we do rather clip, than clipping? Yeah. When it's whether the aesthetic value get lost, hence you practice only feather stripping to the pet birds. Yes. Yeah, you can do that to other birds too. Uh, in fact, when I am, uh, we have uh, geese and ducks that we will feather clip. And the only difference is I will only do one wing instead of both wings. And um, by clipping one wing, if they are outside, they will fly in a semicircle instead of flying straight. So you can either clip both wings or clip one wing, but the wing clip is exactly the same. And I have done it on chickens so that they don't go over the fence. I've done it on ducks so they don't leave a pond. Uh, you would not ever want to do it on a hawk or an owl or an eagle because those feathers do not grow back for about a year. So that's usually a problem there. But uh, you, can, you can do wing clips on any birds at all. And remember that they're going to grow back. So if somebody decides later on they don't want them to be clipped again, they will grow back out just like you getting a haircut. Which birds are non-vegetarian? Which are the vegetarian? What's that? Which birds are non-vegetarian? Which oh. are vegetarian? Yeah, vegetarian and non-vegetarian? Yep. Okay, your, your birds, um, birds can eat meat, even the, the uh, now the little passerine birds, the canaries and the finches are just going to pretty much eat, you know, seed and some vegetables. Your, your uh, hook bills can eat meat. They don't have to, but they can, and they can have a little bit. We just make sure it's not fatty meat. Uh, and uh, now your meat eating birds are gonna be your hawks and your owls and uh, your falcons and your eagles, you know, the, the big um, uh, birds that way, and they are meat eaters. And, you know, they eat mice and rats and rabbits and just whatever they can catch. All the other birds can, can be totally vegetarian or you can offer them a little bit of meat, but the meat is not the main part of their diet. Okay. It's good to feed coriander leaves to budgies. Do you know coriander leaves? I am not familiar with, yeah, I'm not familiar I, with that. It is something like a spinach. Oh, is it like spinach? Yeah, yeah, birds can eat. If, if people can eat it, the birds can eat it. I usually have, um, there's, some, there's some leafy greens that you know, have to be cooked to be good to eat. And some can be raw. The birds, if, if generally, if you can eat it, the birds can eat it. Uh, and again, not, not as the only diet. They need other things, but it can be part of their diet. We have a product called butter clot that made of snake venom that can be used in birds while bleeding. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar. Here in the United States, we used to have cobra venom available. We used it for some other things. Uh, yeah, if what I would do is if you have something that can be used on 
on dog toenail. Like say, if you're in your hospital, you're cutting the toenails on dogs and it got a little short. If there's something that can be put against it um, in a dog, you ought to be able to do it in a bird. Uh, like say, if it's a, if it's something you can, you know, buy it at the, uh, you know, at the, at the store or someplace like that. And if all else fails, you can always, like say, you can always use a little bit of flour or something like that. There's one more drug, alum. Can we, can it be used to stop bleeding? Um, I think alum can. I, I've never used it like that, but it's not dangerous. So, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether alum, I've never, I've never tried alum for that, but like I said, uh, it's not a dangerous, uh, uh, herb. So it, it ought to be okay. That way, not a dangerous powder. I mean, like I said, uh, there's usually a lot of powders for stopping bleeding in, like say in the, in the dogs and things like this, uh, and it ought to be available to buy. Yes. And there's one more question that, what all the vaccines should be given? Uh, really, the birds do not have any vaccines that need to be given. They do not get rabies, so we don't have to worry about that. They have a very high blood te uh, body temperature, so they don't get rabies. Um, um, there are, there's what a vaccine called polyoma vaccine, which is a disease in young birds. Um, we do not see that very much in this country. I'll talk about that disease later, uh, but there is a vaccine for that, um, um, but it's not used very often. Uh, there are some vaccines for poultry, for chickens, uh, like Merrick's disease and uh, fowl pox and some of those, but in the pet birds, there's no vaccines that are necessary. Uh, should the birds be dewormed regularly? What drug can be used? I'm sorry, can they be what or what? Should they be given deworming medicine, like, you know, for worm infestation? Oh, deworming? Yeah, yeah. Deworming. Your, your birds can, they can get uh, parasites, they can get worms, and they're uh, like ascrids or roundworms in those. And you can do a fecal exam in a bird under a microscope, just like you do with uh, dogs and cats. Uh, it is, parasites in the pet birds are not as common as they are in dogs and cats and not as common as it is in chickens and poultry. Um, but if we uh, do have uh, parasites in birds, we can use like pyranopamoate is one of the dewormers. Uh, sometimes we can use uh, a drug called fenbendazole uh, if there's coccidia, uh, there's, uh, we can use uh, uh, medication that way. But parasites in the pet birds, if they're kept indoors, are not a big, big problem. Um, not as much of a problem as they are in dogs and cats or large animals. So I will go over that, but, and they can be dewormed, but it's not a major thing to do. Okay. How to treat curl toe paralysis? How to keep? How to treat curled toe paralysis? Oh, how, curly toe? Yeah. Um, how to treat curly toe paralysis? Yep. Yeah, curly toe paralysis is something we see primarily in, in uh, chickens. That's a nutritional problem. Uh, we have to make sure uh, it's usually a vitamin deficiency, I think, vitamin B. And uh, if every once in a while, if we have a pet bird that has toes that will curl, I will actually take a little bit of tape and I will put a, take a piece of tape, uncurl their feet and tape it on the bottom and then tape a little piece on the top so that I am making a sandwich with their foot in between. So I've got their foot here with, uh, tape on top, tape underneath to make it flat. And we're trying to train, uh, get the toe instead of walking like this, get it straight so that they can walk on it. And I will leave it that way for about a week and then take the tape off and see how they're doing. But if we have a curly toe paralysis is usually in very, very young birds, 
and its nutrition. If it's in older birds, it is usually an injury, uh, such as a leg injury uh, up in the hip area. And if that's the case, then I will use the tape and I'll show everybody next time how to put the tape on. Okay. What are the reasons behind vomiting in parrots and the respective line of treatment? Okay. You can get, yeah, the birds will actually what we call regurgitate rather than vomit because they have the food in their crop. They have crops here that they'll store the food and they will throw it up and they can either throw it up um, because um, if it, it can be an irritant where they ate something that just doesn't agree with them and it's burning or causing some problem, they'll throw it up that way. Number two is most of the problems with regurgitating birds is an intestinal problem. So it's not in the, in, it's not up here. It's actually down in the stomach and the intestines. And we usually have to treat with antibiotics for that. Uh, to stop that vomiting. And it's just like if a dog swallowed a ball and the food can't go through and the dog starts vomiting, the same thing can happen to birds. And we'll go over antibiotics on what to use for that. So it can be either an intestinal problem or an irritant problem, or some birds will vomit when they are in love with you. So if you have a pet bird that wants you to be their their mate, be their other uh, other bird, it's real common for the bird to throw up on you. Or sometimes, like I said, they can throw up or regurgitate on the mirror. And that is, they are in love. The way, <laughs> you, can tell, the way you can tell that is the bird is totally happy, healthy, no problems, eating well, everything's fine. And it only throws up when it's with the owner. Well, I have people and they'll say, the only, he, 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 my, my bird is vomiting. And I say, uh, is it when you're with them or not with them? He said, well, I'm always with them when they vomit. He said, is the bird looking at you and on your shoulder? He said, yeah, they always vomit on my shoulder. He said, your bird is in love. He loves you. So it's not a problem, but it's, it's, it's a nice thing for birds to do, I guess. So, so those are the three ways that the three vomiting that I see is either it can be bacterial or it can be uh, something causing the irritation that we need to, to just get out of the body or it can be in love. One of those three usually. There's one comment about this. Uh, one Dr. Anil said that tinctured benzoin can be given but very painful so it's not used. Okay, what is that on the toenails, you mean? Tinctured benzoin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, it's, um, yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't use that. Yeah, it wouldn't be comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a question. A lot of, lot of thanks, appreciation is there. You can stop sharing, then we can see each other. Okay. Are we, are we finished with the meeting? Yeah, uh, just uh, one second, just stop sharing, then I can, okay. there are no more questions there. There we go. Yep, there we go. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of appreciation for you for the presentation. So there is a one more comment is there. Potassium permanganate can be used. Do you know me? Potassium permanganate. I'm not catching that, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a kind of a, antiseptic drug, potassium permanganate, it's very common used in India. So, uh -huh. own doctor suggesting that that can be used. Oh, for an antiseptic, you mean on the on the, the body of the bird or the skin? For the vomiting. Bleeding is bleeding. bleeding. I think she's talking about vomiting. No, bleeding toe. Oh, for sorry. vomiting? No, oh. no, no, sorry, sorry. Yeah. For, for the bleeding toe. Papa. Yeah. Hey. Oh. Suggesting for that bleeding? Can be used. bleeding toe. Oh, and bleeding toes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, like you say, the big thing you're trying to do is just keep some pressure against it. The, the thing about bleeding toes is we used to think that the birds would bleed to death. If I clipped a toenail and it got a little short, it will bleed to death. 
And what we've really found is the bleeding will stop. We just don't want the owners to get so excited and scared to death because, oh my God, my bird's bleeding, you know? So what I will have people do is, um, I mean, you can use uh, flour and different things like this. Um, if, if you don't have anything except flour or, or something like this, I say, I will even put some on, uh, just get some like this and just put the toe like this until we get some like this. Um, I've used hydrogen peroxide and in an emergency, not that we want to do this a lot in an emergency, I actually had to get a little screwdriver hot on a stove and touch it that way. But that was, that was an emergency. I, I did not have a happy owner and I did not have a happy bird, but everything went well. So, um, what we might do is, um, uh, some of the uh, medications that you have in India, I might, uh, Dr. Dix, have you send me some pictures of them and some, so I can know what you have there and we'll see if there's anything over here that we use the same way. And I can check that out. Yeah. That's one of the, one of the, the challenges of veterinary medicine around the world is we all have different medications. When I came to India and I was, uh, working on water buffalo, I had to, you know, it's a lot of different medicines that we use over here. And it was easy to, to change over. I just had to, had to think how we did that. And it'll be the same there. This, so you, you have everything over there you need. We just need to figure out which ones are available to everybody.